good friends over at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania are now going to lead us through a little William Still session. I'm going to turn it over to Dana Dorman. Rich Molishuk is right there. Let's give him a big NEH welcome. Um, so hello, I'm Dana Dorman. I'm the Historical Society Director. Um, which you'll see in a lot of places is called the William Still Digital History Project. We're actually planning to come up with and have come up with slightly catchier names for the digital resource once it goes live, but this is very descriptive for us for right now, so that's what we're calling it. Um, and basically for the next hour or so, we thought we'd run through kind of what our plans are both right now and longer term, um, show you some of the web templates that we're working from and some of the ideas we have about what we can do with this material. Um, and then we brought the originals so that we can all have some time to kind of take a look at those as well. Um, but first, let me back up. So what I do at HSP, I'm a project manager of this project and a previous digital project. And I also work as a researcher in our library. And what this project is, uh, we are, newly invested in, and this is our third digital project, where we're taking um, images and text transcriptions of original primary source documents in our collections, and using um, something called text encoding. So we are putting XML text encoding in those transcriptions to be able to do some really cool interactive things with the documents. And we'll show you specifics of what that means in a little while. But it allows us to <coughs> connect these two documents in ways that have been very difficult before and really no one has done because of that difficulty. So for the Still Project, what we're doing is we're looking at Journal C, which William Still kept. I'm going to skip over a lot of the history here because I assume that you guys have already been covering sort of the history of the topics. We'll just go right to the documents which is Journal C was kept by William Still between about 1852 and 1857. And in it, he records the conversations he has with fugitive slaves as they're passing through Philadelphia in his work with the Vigilance Committee. About 20 years later, he published a book called The Underground Railroad. We have that on the right. Um, that's a pretty well-known book. You can find it on Google Books, Internet Archive, all kinds of sources like that. And if you ever have ever read it, you'll know it's a little bit dense. There's no index. It's kind of hard to predict the order of the stories within it. Um, so while it's got an amazing, you know, the content within the volume is amazing, about 800 pages, it's a little hard for modern readers to digest. Um, so what we're doing is combining these two sources into one digital resource so that people can now see, once we're finished, um, how the stories in sort of his original source material and then his published book, how they um, support each other. So sometimes, what we think is that as he was writing the book, he was crossing out entries in his journal, and you'll see when you get up and look at it, many, many pages have lines crossed through the entries we think, or researchers think, that that's him um, keeping track of stories that are going to go into his published book. So those are the kinds of things that um, we're really excited to delve more deeply into. And what we're doing right now is a prototype project. We have um, funding in part from NEH to sort of figure out how to set up this new digital resource. And between we started in November, and we will launch this initial prototype in January. And what we're going to be doing is um, testing out how this would work in a digital environment. We're talking with our target audiences to see, you know, up front what would be helpful for them, and then at the end, you know, does this actually work well for them? Um, and from there, we hope to roll this out into another you know, multi-year effort to complete the full project. So for this initial prototype, um, we're working with an external advisory board, which we're part of, 
and um, an outside <coughs> expert, uh, Peter Hanks. And what we've done is try to figure out a more manageable way to kind of approach the topic. So for this initial prototype website, we're focusing on the experiences of families in slavery and on the Underground Railroad. And Peter Hanks, our researcher, helped us identify three sort of family groups to focus on in this initial website. So we focused on um, the story of Harriet Shepherd, who fled from Chestertown, Maryland, or the area around there, with five children and uh, her aunt and uncle, and then three young men probably were the children of the aunt and uncle, but doesn't actually say that. So it was a group of 11, quite you know, significant group leaving. Um, so that's one story that we're gonna focus on. Another story is Frank Wanzer, who fled with a woman that he married en route when they were up in Syracuse. Um, as well as, I can't remember how many were part of that original group, maybe one other couple. Um, yeah, another so couple, and then I think one in the So a group of five. Um, he happened to actually go back south and try to help other family and friends escape. Um, and he ended up successfully coming back northward with his sister-in-law and her husband um, and another you know, individual that we're not sure of the family connection. So that's a second family story. And then the third family that we're focusing on is the Taylor family, um, which is a set of three brothers, and sort of their you know, wives and children. Um, so through those three stories, we're hoping that we'll be able to touch on sort of all the diversity, maybe not all, but a lot of the diversity of experiences of people that William still had contact with. So, you know, gender, age, how they traveled, where they ended up, all those kinds of things. And where we're at so far is that we are essentially going to post the excerpts of the two volumes that relate to those three family stories um, in, a, in a new website. So there will be images of those original pages, as well as the transcriptions of those pages so that students don't have to necessarily decipher you know, the handwriting or they can use that as a guide as they decipher the handwriting. Um, but the many cool interactive things that we'll be able to do thanks to our text encoding includes, um, you know, if it mentions Harriet Shepard in the text, you'd be able to click on her name and up will pop a brief biography about her. Um, if you go to the page about her, you might see an image of her, if we've been able to find one. Um, you'd be able to see all of the other people that she's connected with within these volumes. So family members, people who assisted her in her journey northward, all of those kinds of connections um, will be possible through the text encoding that we're doing. Um, something I wanted to mention there. There's two kind of cool new um, these are building on a, a web template that we've developed for our past text encoding projects. But what's new for William Still is that we're really interested in how people moved over time and how they're connected to other people. So on the digital site, once it launches, we're planning to have maps that allow you to see, you know, he's telling these stories of people as they're moving northward to freedom, sometimes coming back, sometimes going you know, north again, um, that you'll be able to see that movement in a visual way, in addition to reading the stories and catching that you know, in the narrative. So that's one huge component that we're really excited to, to play with and see what we can do. The other one is um, creating network maps. So you've probably seen these kind of six degrees of separation you know, visualizations before. We're really interested to see, once we make all these connections between the people that he's talking about, you know, what new research questions will come up and what new connections will be visible um, by seeing, for instance, the network of people in the Philadelphia area who are helping William Still move all these people through. So in the back of Journal C, he has a list of accounts. 
So he's just keeping track of you know money going out, but it tells you things like so and so um, is getting paid because they boarded someone, um, or they drove them to the train station, or they washed their clothes, and all of these details are sort of highlighting the fact that there was a large number of generally average people in the area who were supporting this work, um, who may not have gotten much of sort of the star attention so far, but were interested to see kind of how that network becomes more illuminated um, by doing this work. So this initial prototype is sort of our first test to see what we can do. Um, we'll be launching the website in January and doing some testing um, then. And assuming that funding is secured for the next phase, we would begin work on the next phase sort of immediately after that um, with a goal of finishing the full project, <coughs> um, you know, probably closer to 2016, 2017. Um, but in the meantime, this initial prototype will be up and working and usable. And we're really excited about it. So I thought maybe we could pop. Do you have a question? Any questions? Yeah. Can I see um, available online? Can you do it online? You can, yeah. So there is both a transcript and images of it right now on HSP's website. Um, the transcript is a little bit easier to use. It's a, I think it's a PDF or a Microsoft Word document. The images, you know, it's about a 400 page book, so it's a little bit clunky to sort of page through. 400 pages, but it, they are available and they are visible. Does anybody else have any questions before I keep moving along? So why don't we sort of pause and make this a little more concrete with some of our examples of our current digital projects and what we have in mind for how this would be usable. And I'm going to pass my microphone and get paper clip over to you. <laughs> Um, I am the project assistant, uh, sort of the right hand to Dana on the William Still Digital History Project. Um, I've also been the project manager for a digital history project that I'm going to show you guys shortly. Um, and I'm also the director, uh, sorry, no, the assistant editor of <laughs> publications, working for the director of publications um, over at HSP. Uh, so I thought that it would be best if I could just kind of take you through some of the main features of the digital history projects that Dana and I have both um, been a part of uh, previous to now so that you can get a sense of what we've come up with so far and what we hope to build off of. So I'm actually going to sit back down now and uh, narrate as I drive. projects uh, that utilize text encoding. Um, one is called uh, Close for Business, and it uses documents from HSP's collection to tell the story of the first bank in Philadelphia that failed for <coughs> um, The other one has launched but actually hasn't officially been announced yet, but you can still see it. Uh, it's called Preserving American Freedom, the Evolution of American Liberties and 50 Documents. And it just uses 50 documents from HSP's collections to um, in an exhibit that basically explores uh, some questions and then some themes to freedom. Um, so in both of these sites, 
uh, users are able to navigate and to explore documents um, in different ways depending on their interests, their inclinations, and what it is that they hope to get out of it. Both provide sort of a landing page which points ways to a sort of curated experience. In the case of Preserving American Freedom, we have exhibit sections so you can kind of slide through and um, you know, choose a section that you want to go to. Um, and if you select the section, you can see all of the material that has sort of been placed in that section. So the documents that are part of the section by theme, uh, maybe some contextual materials, uh, like a contextual essay. Um, Close for Business offers kind of the same thing. Without sections, it has an explore section here uh, where if you were to just go in and not necessarily have any previous knowledge of the subject, or wanted some ideas for how to start exploring the documents, uh, this is a good place to start. You can choose to look at basically a timeline of the main events of the story that the documents narrate. Uh, you can read a biography of the key player. Uh, you can um, look at some education tools. Both websites also offer the ability for users who would prefer to browse and just kind of decide where they want to go on their own, or if they have a very specific idea of what it is that they're looking for, to search uh, through the content. Uh, both provide a list of all of the documents that have been transcribed and annotated and are available for exploration in the exhibit, uh, as well as lists of all the people that are mentioned in the documents, organizations, and general topics. So if, for example, in this site, you were interested solely in, um, in documents that relate to, say, the freedom of speech, you could click and see documents that have been tagged, essentially, as relating to that topic. Um, so that is, so hopefully this provides, you know, sort of different ways for different users uh, to use the site like, as they wish and will reach out, uh, will be um, useful for a wider range of people. Um, we also have the ability to search and to filter lists of documents. So we had all documents say, and we wanted to look only at ones from, say, 1850 to 1860. You can do that. Um, so now we'll show you, you know, what we consider the cool stuff, the documents themselves, right? So I can actually take you straight to, um, for the Preserving American Freedom website, I actually kind of tested out encoding just a very brief excerpt of Journal C. Um, so this is what our document viewer tool looks like on the website that we've developed. So as you can see, we have an image of the original to the left, and we have the transcript to the right. We have a little pager, so you can click through and explore all the content. And you might notice that there are links within the transcript of this document. Um, and this is the case for pretty much all the documents that we encode. Um, We've encoded these documents so that when a person is mentioned, their name becomes a link. And when you click on it, in this case, we actually don't really have much on that person, but I'll pick William Still, who we have a lot on. 
when you click on it, you get a little pop-up box, and you can click through to a full biography and the person that And each person, if you were to have approached this by starting off with a, um, going to straight to the lead still, you would also be able to see all the documents in which he is mentioned. So there's a reciprocal relationship. Um, we also have included footnotes. So, so we can add annotation in this way. And it's a little pop-up, so if you don't care about the footnotes or you just want to read them, you know, read the whole thing first and then read footnotes later, uh, that's fine. You can uh, just come through and interact with them uh, as you like. Uh, one of the other things that's great about the uh, name tagging is that, let's say, this guy, Lewis Childs, um, let's say later on he uses an alias. This is actually the case with many people in um, Williamsville. Uh, we can encode these names, essentially, in such a way so that even if later on this individual is referred to by a different name, um, Batman, for example, uh, you could click on Batman and it would take you to the biography of Lewis Childs because the human who has encoded this, the person with the actual knowledge of the subject matter, um, has made that connection and is able to you know, have, have the computer basically show like, what this is the link between them. Um, and one more thing about the viewer is that if you want to get up um, in closer detail, you can just click on the image and you can see the transcript, but you can also uh, zoom in and around on the document. So this is actually very helpful, especially for um, handwritten documents. Uh, we know that they are not necessarily easy to read even when you have them right in front of you. Uh, but we hope that this will encourage people uh, not just you know, to look at the, the text in terms of the transcript, but maybe to actually explore and try and see if they can actually read some of the 19th century you know, handwriting themselves. Um, well, what is the line through each passage mean again? Well, we think, we believe that um, so William still used his journal C um, basically as the foundation for writing um, the Underground Railroad. So when he was writing his book text, he was basically just looking at journal C the whole time and kind of copying down the stories, uh, sometimes elaborating. But sometimes the, you know, it's more or less verbatim um, from journal C. Uh, so what we think is that as he was composing the text for his public work, uh, he was just striking out the sections that he'd gone through, kind of to keep track. Um, so, and then there are uh, the, the website templates, basically, that we have for these digital history projects, uh, allow us to not only present documents, um, and then their transcriptions, but a lot of sort of additional material um, to help contextualize um, the contents of the documents uh, and to enrich different users in different ways. So we have the capability, for example, to add, you know, like about this document, um, you know, descriptions uh, to maybe point to other content uh, on other HSP sites or uh, on our official library. Um, we have uh, an educator section on both websites, which actually just has basically uh, tools for teachers um, and lesson plans that believe uh, that teachers could use uh, in order to use these digital exhibits in the classroom. Um, we have contextual essays, 
uh, which for many users are a pretty good thing to consult before diving right into the text of the primary documents or that um, you know, educators, if they're using the primary documents, might have their students read this first. Um, and then sometimes we have extra little tools like the uh, Preserving American Freedom site, for example, uh, has a timeline. Um, sort of a little interactive thing where you can scroll through and click on events, and then these can link also to the documents themselves, and you can see the relationship between the documents and events. Um, so that was sort of a new little feature that got added to the Preserving American Freedom site, which um, is, came slightly later than uh, Close for Business. And so for the Still project, we're thinking that we're going to have some extra goodies up here. Instead of the timeline, we might have a link to maps. And this might be um, where you could start exploring uh, a geographic map, which would show you movements of people, of fugitives, or distribution, say, of, um, of conductors or agents uh, in space and over time, uh, and that could also map connections between people. Uh, yes? Um, a little on top, but a little off, um, as we encourage our kids to um, make their own careers. I'm wondering, are you guys historians or are you IT people? What, what, in college, what, what did you take up? Because you sound like IT people. And then you sound like historians. Yes. No, <laughs> that's probably a good thing. Uh, we are historians. Okay. And we've picked up, we are, we are picking up um, IT uh, tools for our toolbox uh, sort of as needed. Uh, it's been a, a fun learning curve. Um, but we, I think, both definitely come from this from the history and the library, and you know, in my case, the publishing world. Oh, so you also some of this. You created this whole Facebook page. Well, no, we uh, contracted with an outside vendor to actually. Yeah. Well, we're not that techy, so um, <laughs> um, we contracted with uh, outside vendors to actually build um, these websites for us, and they're going to keep on helping us develop the tools that we want to be able to develop uh, for Williams still. Um, which is not to say that we haven't been doing a fair amount of very computer-oriented stuff ourselves in order to do this text encoding that we've been talking about. Uh, basically, it involves taking a transcript or creating a transcript by transcribing um, the original documents and I don't know if you've ever played around on the internet with putting little tags on things mm -hmm. to make a tout. You basically just, we've been learning the language to use these specialized sets of tags that let us say, okay, this is a paragraph, this is a chapter, this is a letter, this is a name, this is a place. Um, and then we kind of work with, uh, with the really with the actual IT people to help kind of translate that coding into tools that will transform it into a beautiful website that works. Similar to William Still, in his journal here, are there drawings or sketches of maps that show the roots or show people or is it just strictly mm. writing? Not so much in Journal C. Uh, in the Underground Railroad, there are some, um, some illustrations, some really great illustrations actually. Um, and there are some ways to, uh, there are some tags we can, we can add to that. Um, you know, it's not as uh, developed as what we can do with the text, but we can at least, you know, tell the computer, this is a picture, this is the caption on the picture, this is what page it's on. And then the image viewer allows um, the user to see the picture and scroll in, you know, Look at the details. Yeah, the um, it's hard to start sharing the mic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, oh. Here we go. Okay. Um, his journal.
journal, he does a very good job of recording place names. So all the information is there, it's just not visual. So that's why we were particularly interested in trying to compile all that into a visual presentation. Um, because you'd have to read all 400 pages of the journal to really get a sense of well, where are all these people coming from? Are they all going to the same place or not? So we're hopeful that once we finish all of that technical work, you know, it'll seem instant, but it's actually years of <laughs> encoding, um, that you'll be able to see, wow, there's a lot of people coming from the same county, um, and what does that tell you about you know, the stories that are being shared from there that they know to come this way, or maybe it's because of the transportation routes that are accessible at that time, that it just sort of naturally funnels people through. Uh, so we're really excited to see what will end up once we can click that button and see it on a map. Uh, but his journal does not include mm -hmm. that kind of sketch. Is there a resource that lists all the places already, or you have to start from scratch and go to each page? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yep. Wow. <laughs> And just to add back on the sort of student career paths, you know, increasingly, sorry, um, like the more technical skills people can get in terms of computer and, um, you know, IT knowledge, the better. Um, so we definitely came into this with some knowledge of kind of how to do digital projects, but we're, you know, we're already like way beyond where we started from just working in it. Um, and I can only imagine that if we had come in with that experience from the beginning, um, you know, who knows what we'd be able to do by this point. But, uh, but yeah, we're still relying on experts to actually build the, the pretty stuff for the, the end users. Any other questions on anything we've talked about so far? Yeah. I, I just want to add to that question. Do you know if there are any majors now in this type of Field, um, the library science um, ma majors have information <coughs> technology sub major. Yeah, I'll also ask. say. Um, so my I got my master's in public history, um, and there's no guarantee that any programs uh, will actually. Give you instruction in this, uh, but I would say that more and more in both um, history, public history, uh, museum studies, and um, library and information science, uh, the ability to at least gain experience uh, in trying to do work of this sort uh, is definitely growing. So the other thing I was going to do, um, I have two things I'm going to hand around. One is just an information sheet about the project, so you can take it with you. It has our URL, it has our contact info. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions, and then the other thing I want to pass around. So once this launches in January, one of our sort of skipped over this part, but one of our um, our target audiences for this research resource are educators, so both um, college professors and secondary you know, school teachers, uh, people who might use this with a group of students. So obviously we have the <coughs> students in mind as well, but we're particularly interested in educators who are using this as part of their lessons. So um, that's one of our major audiences. And then the second one is researchers as well as genealogists um, who would be using this for their own research purposes, not necessarily in a classroom setting. Um, so we've already talked to you know, representatives of these different groups um, to get their feedback on what kinds of things they'd be interested in seeing on a website like this. Um, but we're also going to be doing a lot of follow-up to um, ask for feedback once the prototype is done in January. So I'm also going to pass around um, a sign-up sheet. I'll put one through each sign. Um, if you're interested and want, oh, oh, a pencil spine. Okay. We work in an archive, we know about pencils. <laughs> um, 
If you're interested in participating in that testing, um, either by filling out a survey or maybe even doing some test lessons, um, please sign up and we'll be following up with you um, once we have something that's actually ready to test. Um, and that would be great. And otherwise, I thought we would, if nobody else has any questions, we can look at the actual items. So on the left up here is the journal. Um, and we have it open to Frank Lancer's story. So on the right-hand page, you'll see that is the account of this particular group that came through um, Frank and his uh, soon-to-be wife and um, three other um, individuals. And then it's the same story open in the published book 20 years later. And there is a illustration of the group. Um, they are interesting because they um, essentially, their pursuers or some pursuers caught up to them, and there was a bit of a gun battle. Um, and so there's an illustration of them with their uh, wagon or carriage, I can't remember which, uh, with guns ablazing. Um, so thanks so much for, for taking some time. And uh, well, this, okay, this doesn't launch until January 2014. Is that still project? That's right. Do you have? Is there something that you let's say that um, we wanted to say substitute something until this was ready? Mm -hmm. Where would we go? Okay. Um, so you've got a few options. Uh, we have a project page for the website um, at the which is on your website. handout. Mm -hmm. um, there's a URL. Yeah. And so we'll post that on the Yahoo chat room so that you have a live link. So for you, our you abolitionist have, seminar. You post it already? I'll post that today. You post it today? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, All so right. this just provides an overview of the project and also kind of points you towards uh, some of the blog posts we've been writing um, over the course of our work on this. Um, now, if you wanted to look at some of, start exploring some of the um, primary sources yourself, uh, We've got, oh, hang on. Um, They'd probably be interested in your Food and Freedom project. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we have uh, images from the original primary source of um, Journal C um, in the HSP's digital library. Um, so, which is just digitallibrary.hsp.org. Mm -hmm. And it's also a link, it's a hyperlink just from the main project page uh, is a, an easy way to find it. Um, so this is not a transcription, but you can start, um, you can take a look at the uh, pages and try and read them yourselves. And um, it's not entirely complete, I think, we found over the course mostly, of... Though, it's mostly, though. It, it is mostly in there. Um, and over the course of us working on this project, we're going to update this record to make sure that we actually do have a complete facsimile. Um, so there's a PDF with the transcript? Is it on the site as well, or what did I say? Um, then on, I should email this to Richard so that he can put it on um, your uh, Yahoo thing. Um, there is an earlier digital project, a little harder to get to. Um, if you look in the left menu, you'll see Journal C. Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, where there's an earlier transcription um, on the list. That's the one I have on your uh, NEH schedule. Okay, so you so you do have the, the link to I think it. so. Okay. Um, which has uh, a transcription with some footnotes, very useful. Um, you can click through, there is a web-based thing, you can browse uh, journal entries by year. Um, so this would also probably be, be a good start um, to explore Journal C. Uh, the Underground Railroad, um, is a public domain work. Okay. Um, so you will probably, I think you can find it on Google Books, you can find it on the Internet Archive, um, which is 
uh, the web address is archive.org. Um, if you just Google, and you know, the Underground Railroad, you'll it'll come on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Underground Railroad, but by Louise still, yeah, because there's actually a few books out there published that are titled The Underground Railroad. And he also, there's a space, when he writes railroad, it's rail space road, so in mm -hmm. case you're searching for it, that's how you find his book. Yeah. They're both definitely worth checking out. Can you, can you describe what text encoding is? What is that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So text encoding, um, it's in XML, which is very similar to HTML, um, which is a diff you know, slightly different language. And essentially the idea is, you know, when you type something in an email or in Microsoft Word, it's just a string of characters. So you have to type exactly the right string of characters in order, um, in order for the machine to know that that's what you're looking for. So if you're looking for William Still, you type W-I-L-L, -L, blah, blah, blah. Um, what text encoding does is allows you to describe the text as well as you know, just have a transcription. So you can say, this is a name of somebody. This is William Still. So you can add this code around it that says, this string of characters means this person, William Still. And so if someone later in, in today's lingo, like in an email, says Mr. Still instead of William, you could still say, this is the same guy. Even though they didn't say William Still, they meant him. Or dates are also really easy to explain. So if someone says June 1st, it's, you know, the machine doesn't know, does that mean this year? Does that mean 10 years ago? They just know that you wrote J-U-N-E space one. Um, what we do with encoding is put a code around that to say, all right, this person wrote June 1st. They actually mean June 1st, 1855. And whether they say June 1st, whether they write 6 slash 1, whether they write tomorrow, we can code that so that the machine always understands that that actually means June 1st, 1855. So it's, it's essentially a way to let <coughs> machines understand what's in the text as well as showing users what it says on the page. So it's adding information about how it should appear, it's adding information about the meaning of the text. Um, that, when you that say the change, you mean the yeah. computer. Oh. Yeah. So now, like people in other countries, they usually put the date first. Exactly. And the month second. Right. So how would that work in that aspect? So we're following the standards of something called the Text Encoding Initiative. So what we would do is transcribe it exactly as on the page. And then there's this international standard of how you encode that so that any computer would understand what it means. So it doesn't matter if the person puts the year first or last, the, any computer reading it that understands the standard um, would be able to tell the, what that original creator meant when they wrote it. Can I ask a question here which I'm really interested in because I get students from you all. What is it that your students need most in trying to understand William Still, the Underground Railroad, and this issue? You've been here for two weeks. We've got another two weeks. We've talked about this a little. I think what's unique about this group is this isn't just a group of educators. This is a group of people who are in a seminar on abolition. So this is a group of ringers, in a way. So as you're thinking about all of this and what we've learned so far, particularly things like vigilance committees, which we did today with David Ruggles, we've done traditions of black freedom seekers. What is it your students need, you think, from a project like this so that when you assign something to them, they can say, that's cool. Is it the basic info and the history? Do you do that and they need more tricked out websites? Just, I'm just curious, since we have this time together, um, what is it you need? Because that's interesting for me, and it might be helpful for them. Definitely, um, my kids would need interpretation from the script. So, um, to have it transcribed underneath is helpful. Um, because as soon as they see the script, they're like, no, I don't want to read it. It's too much. So to see it underneath 
um, is, is helpful, definitely. And for me, the have that connection, you know, like you, you read about one person, then you talk about um, Charles, and then they go like, well, who's that person? Because they may not have that background information. They are able to just click right there, and boom, they find out who the child is. For me, it would be a way to make a print out of not just the script part, but also print out of the text. So they can actually look at it. Uh, some of my kids have traced over the letters to try and figure out what the words are, and they can't do that online. They need a pencil to do that. It would be really important to have, um, when you're scrolling over the different cases, a little blurb about each person's name to help the students before you get into the text. Um, I think that's how they, a lot of them learn. Um, I don't know, like, it comes to my Huffington Post when you go to look at their articles on that. You can briefly read in two to three sentences nitty gritty and then if you're interested in it click on the rest of it I think that'd be great I think that's how this generation of kid millennials is learning mm -hmm. I didn't hear what she said but for me I wouldn't I wouldn't want my students to see this first mm -hmm. I would want them to see the primary source document my whole thing is my purpose is for them to develop critical thinking I don't know if this will allow them to do that in other words this is doing the thinking for them I want them to see if they can analyze the, the original document. Maybe like the the SCH, they would they would think it's school if they didn't know schooner. So for that would be helpful, yeah, but I want them to see the original document. Maybe be able to click on some of the encrypted um, was it abbreviations maybe. Is I have a question. Nobody has a question. I think I'm I'm at that like, where the family started and Something that they can look to say, oh, well, I'm from, you know, this state, let me see if I can find it. I realize this would be an enormous addition to this, but I teach <coughs> younger grades, and I know other teachers to, you know, teach younger grades. Uh, I think that if you're creating it, um, maybe have a, we have the, the transcript, maybe have like a brief summary that might have a little symbol for, you know, the younger viewer, you know, and that way they'd be able to kind of get a summary of what it is at, at a, you know, at a level that they would understand over yeah. the I think also the more you can do it thematically and break it down to, um, depending on the age groups, the more accessible it will be. I mean, older kids can probably sift through that and um, have more literary understanding and just literacy for the text, but younger kids definitely will probably need more kids. I, I think along those lines, that I think of a database that my uh, school subscribes to called a historical newspaper, and um, students put in keywords and they don't really know what to do with whatever spat back at them. And so some of, I think, what you were doing, the way that it was being um, organized um, in sort of a discrete list, I feel like it's easier um, to have them have you know, a list that if you have three themes or three parts of William Still's life, and then there are five documents each under there, so they know what they're looking for as opposed to a keyword search, or I think not as opposed to, in addition to a keyword search, so where, um, you know, when, when we use historical newspapers and students don't know what to do, I'm like, they have, they have a timeline there, and you click on, you know, they put a theme there, you click on it, and it at least gives you a place to start of, here are 10 articles, or here are, uh, that, that have to do with that. Ernesto, did you want to? Um, you said earlier, the way you chose the stories would have to do with family, and I understand that those families have led up to the present? No, I mean, the idea was, there's so much to cover right. in the topic that we decided to focus on sort of one interpretive theme and the theme that we came up with, with advice from our advisory group and um, you know, a subject expert who's working with us, is the experience of families. So we could have um, you know, focused on perhaps one particular geographic route, or we could have focused on you know, maybe gender, like let's look at the experiences of women. So among the kind of top half dozen choices that people brainstormed, we decided that families seemed particularly um, you know, evocative and would sort of be interesting to all of our target audiences. So, so these three family groups that we're um, focusing on, it allows us to just 
narrow the list. I think there's something like 2,100 names mentioned in the books, the, the volumes. Um, this allows us to get down to more like 75. Um, so we can just talk about the people who are associated with those three family group stories. You know, everything from this is their, you know, the slaveholder that they escaped from, to this is who helped them, to this is where they ended up, and people that they knew, you know, wherever they ended up. Um, so that, that's how we come up with 75. There's not 75 family members, but just the universe of those stories um, is a little bit more digestible for users as well as this initial kind of go around. Does that answer? I, I just wanted to add, to clarify, we kind of mentioned this before, but um, I'll mention it again. Um, so what we have now, this project, this prototype, this family center thing, is um, the, it's going to be the outcome of a one-year planning grant. So the idea is that um, in the future, we will be applying the same level of encoding um, and interpretation to the full text of both documents, um, which contain their 2,200 names and who even knows how many stories. Uh, so we chose the theme of families and these three families in particular uh, because we were trying to figure out what would a satisfactory product be um, at the end of one year and what sort of infrastructure um, for the larger project should we be trying to set in place during this time that would allow us in the future to roll out full documents and to explore additional interpretive pathways. So are you doing text encoding and generating metadata for the entire document or just for the portions that center around these families? Uh, these families first, uh, okay. everybody, everything else later. Okay. Um, so in order to create, um, in order to create the metadata and text encoding uh, for these three families, we have to do a bit of it, um, you know, at the full document level in terms of, you know, author, uh, title, um, and we're kind of setting in place. Uh, we're sort of lining our ducks up so that when we are able to tackle um, the rest that is in these three excerpts, uh, we should be able to uh, do a role. And I, I ask because I think of potential for a database that you could make, uh, a kind of a corollary to the Atlantic Slave Trade database, of course on a much smaller scale, but you could essentially do that for the Underground Railroad, where you create a kind of interactive kind of uh, structure where students could go and ask their own kind of questions of this Underground Railroad database. Mm -hmm. Seems like there's a, a lot of potential there. Yeah, no, that's, I think, exactly the goal. Okay. Yeah. Evidently, someone sat and read through these journals and determined which family would be cho chosen. How was the selection determined about which three families would be focused on? Well, we, um, we're working with an expert on the, the two books, um, and he, we basically told him what we were looking for in terms of, you know, we want to try to cover as many of the possible stories as we can, um, and he pitched stories to us. So um, there's obviously many more than just these three. And we sort of looked at the ones that he'd identified and tried to narrow it down based on, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, as Rachel said, like get our ducks in a row. So we tried to pick stories that would let us kind of dabble in a lot of different types of stories so that we can try to anticipate the full range of things that might be included eventually. So, so basically, he told us what might be a good idea, and we said, these, out of your list, look at these. I just wanted to add to that, because I was part of some of those initial discussions about themes and stuff, and there, was, there were a lot of great ideas, and I think it was very tough for you all to decide which way to go, but this is brilliant. Um, 
and just thinking about this makes me go back to our question about the power of one. Three families escape, and that brings you into the world of 75 people. So if 900 people escape over a decade, think about how many Americans, white, black, northerners, southerners, are now involved in a debate over slavery, whether it's good or bad, people of African descent have rights, what tactics are available. It really makes that come alive in a way I didn't think before, because now you actually have a catalog. It's not just three people or three families escaping, it's all the people in that web. So I think it's brilliant. And by the way, the person who was the subject expert, you heard it before, which might have passed over that, that's Peter Hinks, who wrote our David Walker um, essay. So he's well known to you. I think there was a... I know you're focusing on 1852 to 1857 with these families. Have you thought of going beyond that, like at a later date, maybe looking at like the genealogy and how like, the name has been, has been carried on and passed on through generations and what other connections they might have in history? Yeah, I mean, what Peter is also doing for us is helping to write up um, brief biographies of these you know, 75 or so people. So the idea with these biographies is that it would, you know, kind of fill out that picture as much as we are able to. Um, you know, in some cases we know where they ended up and they're, you know, extremely well-known stories. They're you can probably find their email addresses of their ancestors online because they're very public about their connection. Um, in other cases, you know, it's really hard to find any information. So Harriet Shepard, for instance, um, is one of our feature stories. It's hard to, you know, it's, she sort of disappears after she passes through Philadelphia. And in fact, in um, Still's journal, what we have noticed is that there's you know, he has his journal, and then he has this list of accounts showing how he paid for room and board and travel and things like that. And um, there's only a set number of people who show up and pass through his um, his hands, so to speak. So we notice that there happens to be someone who shows up as Mrs. Smith with sort of the appropriate number of children. And so we are wondering, well, that might be Harriet Shepard. Um, otherwise, you know, there's no sign of her. And of course, Mrs. Smith is such a common name that it's not necessarily going to help um, researchers find her wherever she ends up. So some of it ends up being speculation in terms of, well, we think that this happened, you know, we think this person's letter from Elmira in New York is referring to this group, so they must have passed through there, um, those, those types of things. But yeah, our idea very much is to fill out the, the stories of these people as much as we can um, into the present, not only for educators, but we're also, you know, at HSP, very interested in genealogy and genealogists, and think that this will be, um, you know, sort of a unique new resource for people who are doing um, genealogy into their African American ancestry, um, and that's right in keeping with William Still's uh, sort of stated purpose for both the journal and the book is to help families connect divided by slavery. So you know, that's one of the reasons he put himself at great personal risk to write all of this down so that people would be able to find um, their family members later. Um, so. All right, well, let's look at the documents. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I might actually uh, pull one of them over here just so people can, they don't have to all wait to watch one. Um, so I'll move the less delicate one. 